This week, we discuss the presidency of Andrew Jackson. Now, in the era of good feelings uh, lecture, we talked about how he got elected. Andrew Jackson's big thing, his watchword was democracy. Everybody gets a fair shake. Everybody is treated the same. Everybody has a vote. Um, everybody has a proper saying what's happening in the United States. Uh, example, he also tried to be the every man, and he after he was inaugurated, invited the public who were there at the inauguration to come into the White House and they sort of tried to have a party, which would never happen these days, but that's, you know, kind of the point and his message that I'm no better than anybody else, democracy, everybody come on in, um, you know, this is for the people, uh, this is what the people say. That being said, there are three big issues during Jackson's eight years as president that sort of define him, define his presidency, and you can see where his head at and how he thought based on how he handles those issues. The first is the Native Americans. Um, the Native Americans posed sort of a problem. Um, they were there and the settlers and the pioneers frankly wanted their land. Uh, what to do? Uh, in Georgia, there was a, main, a big problem. The Cherokee had land in Georgia that was theirs. There were Georgians um, who wanted on to that land. The state of Georgia had said, no, that's the Cherokee's land. You know, you can't go there and settle it. You know, tough luck, end of story. Um, they took their case all the way to the Supreme Court trying to get onto the Cherokee's land. And the Supreme Court said, no, Georgia is right. You know, you cannot let the settlers onto the Cherokee's land. It's theirs. Um, you know, the court also said, although Georgia is right, Georgia doesn't really have the authority to make that decision because the federal government deals with the Native Americans, not the states. You know, but our decision is it's the Cherokee's land. There's nothing you can do. Um, supposedly, um, this is sort of urban legend, uh, Andrew Jackson said, and quote, John Marshall has made his decision, let him enforce it. Um, Andrew Jackson was all about moving the Native Americans west. Um, in fact, there was a Indian Removal Act, which specifically would pay to move different tribes and different Native Americans west, west of the Mississippi, to a reservation out basically in the middle of nowhere where, you know, the settlement line had not yet reached. Um, it, Andrew Jackson's point was, well, if you do that, then they're not bothering the settlers. The settlers, in turn, are not bothering the Native Americans. The Native Americans can live however they want. There's plenty of opportunity out there. If they want to farm, if they want to hunt, whatever it is they want to do, you know, they can live their life. The settlers can then live their life and get what they want here. Um, so Andrew Jackson really, truly believed that he was doing what was best, not only for the settlers, but also for the Native Americans. Um, probably the example of how, oh, the worst example of how this went wrong. And this, this was not typical by any means. Um, but the Cherokee, who I talked about before, were eventually forced to move. Um, there were a small group of Cherokee who were kind of tricked, I guess, or coerced into signing a treaty that gave up their land and therefore uh, the rest of the tribe was forced to go. Uh, they did not want to go. They were not ready for it because uh, they didn't think that the treaty was valid and that they would have to. The government forced them anyway. Um, and a lot of the Cherokee died along the way to their reservation out west um, that was the Trail of Tears, um, if that name rings a bell for any of you. Um, so moving the Native Americans west, huge issue. Uh, the other huge issue was taxes. There was a huge debate over taxes. Now, I don't mean income tax. I mean taxes on stuff. Things that you buy in the store, things that get brought into the country. Huge debate. What should the tax rate be? Should it be high? Should it be low? Um, the prevailing wisdom, or, you know, or the thought of the day was, 
put a higher tax on goods that are imported, on goods that are coming into the country from somewhere else. Make them more expensive with the high tax and therefore make people buy more American products because they'll be cheaper and then you can support the American businesses. Makes perfect sense. Um, in 1828, there was a tax law passed that did just that. It raised the taxes on imported goods. Um, South Carolina in particular was not very happy with that law. The South in general was not happy with it. Um, the South in general did not benefit from that tax. The, the South did not have you know, the, the factories that were making things that would benefit from this tax, um, they just were the consumer. And so all they saw was higher prices. And they sold a lot of cotton to other countries, and they were worried that if we put a high tax on British stuff coming into our country, the British will put a high tax on our cotton that goes into their country, the British will then buy less cotton, and it'll be a problem for us. Um, to the point um, that John C. Calhoun, who at one point had been vice president um, and was now a senator from South Carolina, essentially said, this tax in South Carolina is null and void, meaning it's not a thing in South Carolina, the law does not apply to us, we're not going to pay it. Now, his argument was, number one, it hurts South Carolina. Number two, as a state, we have the right to choose which laws we're going to abide by and which we are not. Um, that concept of nullification has been around for a while. Um, John C. Calhoun really tests it. And Andrew Jackson has a choice in his hand. He can force South Carolina to pay the tax or he can let it go. Ultimately, he chose to force South Carolina into paying the tax. Why? Because if you allow one state to do this and say, we're not going to ab abide by a federal law, then every other state is going to do the exact same thing with any, any law that they don't like, and you would have chaos, right? So Jackson realized, okay, i got to put my foot down because this would, could be bad. Um, he literally had to send warships or Navy ships to the coast of Charleston to kind of send his message, hey, this is going to happen, um, whether you like it or not. And eventually, um, as South Carolina paid. Uh, but it's an interesting story, and keep in mind that this idea of nullification, that a state can pick and choose which laws it thinks are good and which are bad, or which federal laws it wants to obey by and which federal laws it doesn't, sticks around until the Civil War. And the South is going to use nullification as part of their justification for um, leaving the Union uh, in 1861. So, again, keep that in mind. The third issue is the Bank of the United States, or the BUS, as I like to refer it, B-U-S, Bank of the United States. Um, the, the Bank of the United States has been around since 1816, after the War of 1812. Andrew Jack, it was a federal law that created this bank. It was supposed to have federal money in it. Um, Andrew Jackson hated it with the passion of a thousand horses. Why? He, he felt like it wasn't democratic because there were people who were running the bank that were not elected. Um, and he didn't feel like it was good for the country. He thought that it was too much. And so he basically went on a one-man crusade, a one-man mission, to get rid of that bank. Now, um, I won't go into the details, but ultimately he succeeds. Again, think about this. He's a Western guy. He's fighting for removal of the Native Americans so that more settlers can go. He is fighting for what he feels like is democracy um, in that sense. Um, so you see some of his core values coming out. One of the more controversial presidents. Um, I hope that you learned a little about Andrew Jackson and uh, maybe are inspired to go and read in the chapter and learn a little bit more about him. Thanks.